So in one of my previous videos on Node.js, we learned how to optimize long running blocking tasks that are running on the main thread. And there we used a thing called set immediate, just like set timeout and set interval. We have another method available in Node.js called set immediate, which does a thing called chunking. Chunking means we take a long task, which is blocking our main thread, we're gonna chunk it into smaller pieces and then the main thread is gonna be able to perform operations between those chunks. Now set immediate is not available in the browsers, in pretty much in any browser. That's why we need to use something else. To overcome this issue, whenever we have long running blocking tasks in the browser, and that's what we're gonna learn in this video. And we're gonna learn how to use the scheduler API. It's a new API that's coming into our browsers, and that's exactly what's gonna help us in this video. Let's get started. All right, so we're gonna start with this blocking example. Blocking example is basically a very huge for loop. We're looping 10 billion times. And while this is running, let me actually run this. So we're trying to run it. And while this is running, our whole UI of the application is blocked, meaning our user cannot interact with anything. No buttons, no form fields. So everything is blocked for almost 10 seconds. And this message that we see here appears only at the end of the heavy operation, okay? The operation is finished. And by the way, I apologize for the font size. I didn't really find a way to make it bigger in this on the specific website. But anyway, you get the idea. So we want to avoid this by using chunking, okay? And instead of using set immediate, like we usually did in Node.js, now we don't have access to the Node.js, but we have a new shiny API called the scheduler API, okay? Before the scheduler API, let me show you the old way you would do it. So the old way would be using the set timeout, okay? Let me refresh the page and see how it's gonna look like. So the test started, non-blocking, and you can see that while this task was running, we printed out something, printed out something in here. So we said another task can be processed and again. So we probably see this eight or 10 times, meaning while this operation was running, we had 10 chances to run something else, meaning our main thread can do some other operations in between. This is really helping our main thread because uh, the page is not gonna be that laggy anymore. And what we do here, we define a batch size let's say something smaller than 10 billion, of course, so that we have some air to breathe. Okay, and here we're basically checking if the batch size has, has reached the limit and so on. And if not, we call this recursively, okay, with the use of set timeout. And of course, we set it to zero. Now this looks really hacky. We don't want to use that anymore because we have our scheduler API. What does the scheduler API look like? First of all, Keep in mind that for now it has a limited availability. It's only in Chromium websites. In Firefox it's under the flag, so somehow we can use it and Safari obviously has not implemented it yet. So the schedule API is giving us two instance methods, post task and a yield one. And of course you can chain it like this and you can check if the schedule is available in the browser or not. If not, um, you probably need to use the site timeout that we did before. So let's take a look at the yield. The yield is gonna be working like this. So instead of having a set timeout, we're simply gonna copy this await scheduler dot yield. Now my browser is modern, so it's already supporting it. I'm gonna do this await scheduler dot yield. And now I actually don't need to use the timeout anymore. How cool is that? Let me remove that. And since we're using await here, we need to make sure that our function is also async. Async, not imc, async. And now if I refresh the page and delete the logs, we're basically gonna see the same thing. So another task can be processed and we have some air to breathe. This is really cool, okay? So schedule API is something that looks like this. But this is not all. The schedule API also has another method called post task. Post task is something even cooler. Post task gives us a way to, first of all, not only uh, yield to the main thread, but also define a priority. We can define a priority and the priority can be user blocking, user visible or background. And user blocking is you're telling it through the browser that uh, sure, I want to yield it to the main thread, but this is really critical. Less critical 
and background is the least critical. Meaning if you actually do this in the browser, you're gonna end up having this sequence. So user blocking is always gonna be fire ring first, user, um, how, was it, how was it called? User, oops, I almost lost it. Uh, user visible is gonna be the second and user background is gonna be the third. So let's actually try to implement this. So instead of this scheduler.yield, what I'm gonna do is say scheduler post task like this post task this accepts an anonymous function and inside the anonymous function we're gonna call our recursive function um, process next batch for batching and the second parameter of this post task is gonna be the object with a priority so we're gonna say priority did I spell it right prior Priority, yes, and let's say background. Okay, background means it's the least priority. And if you define user blocking, user visible, and background, background is going to be the last of those three. Now let's refresh the page and see. All right, it's pretty much the same behavior, but now you have simply more control. Okay, now one thing that I also want to show you, and by the way, notice that this message will appear immediately after starting the non-blocking task, and it does appear immediately after the function is called. Again, another benefit of chunking, it already appears in the very beginning. Another cool thing is that the schedule API gives us this class called task controller. What is task controller? Well, nothing else than a feature that lets you to dynamically set this priority. Let's say you start the priority with a background. So by default, it's gonna, I think, start with a background. We need to check, double check that. Um, I think it's gonna start with a background. Oh yeah, we're defining it as a background. And then at some point, we change the priority to user visible. So this basically gives you control. All right, another thing that it also gives you is we already have a video on abort controllers. But you can do the same thing. You can abort this controller and then this controller is no longer going to be active. Okay, how cool is that? And of course, you can use the signals here to hook into the signal. All right, guys, I hope you liked it. Go give it a try in your code as well. If you are dealing with a lot of data processing in your application and smash like and subscribe because I'm going to be posting more interesting videos. All right, see you guys in the next one. Goodbye.